I want to talk about this, but really quickly, Ben Shapiro. This is just sort of like potpourri, and we're talking about the Indians next. That's crazy. Ben Shapiro <laughs> last night, it looks like the Berkeley police, I, I, just from everything I've seen, did a fantastic job. They didn't bow down to violence. They didn't. I know in one event, I think they had turned over a park to some violent agitators, but apparently they just did a great job last night. So conservatives at Berkeley could actually hear a conservative speaker without having windows smashed in. Yeah, the city looked like it was on lockdown. There were cement dividers, people boarded up their you know, windows. It was a city <laughs> in, paralyzed by Ben Shapiro, who's a, a very nice guy. He's not really a bomb thrower. Uh, he wears a yarmulke and he's being attacked by people as a white supremacist. He was among the people who were first and most viciously attacked by white supremacists in 2015 a actually, who were way, activated by a lot of the defamation League, De Defamation League says he was the most attacked journalist of 2016 with racial attacks because he is a Jew. And these clowns out in Berkeley are saying he's a Nazi. One, per one person last night said, hey, we're, we should do exactly what people should have done when Hitler was rising. Well, the, somebody tweeted back, you actually are, you were harassing a Jew and committing <laughs> violence because a Jew wants to talk. So yeah, congratulations, you are doing what Hitler did. I mean, I got it a lot, a lot less than Ben did, but we received attacks online from people who were sending you cartoon images of Jews being shot in the head, yeah. of people photoshopping your face in a gas chamber. And to have that, be thrown back at you as you're a white supremacist and we're going to violently yeah. resist your right to speak is perversion by definition. There's also a cheapening of the term white supremacist happening right now. Right. It's being used as a catch-all for somebody I disagree with, somebody whose politics I don't like. Ben Shapiro, as you said, he, he parted ways with Donald Trump, he left Breitbart, he did all those things and he has been attacked relentlessly. He says inflammatory things, he does, of course he does, but the idea that he's a white supremacist just cheapens because there are white supremacists right. in our midst and there are people we need to be focused on. But when you throw that term out and you make it an umbrella term for all the people that you, whose politics you don't like, it's not good for the society because you've now cheapened the term to the extent we don't know who actually is a white supremacist. Right. I don't know. All right, uh, why don't we go to uh, the news now? Eddie's got it. Hold on, Eddie. Get it. <laughs> we'll go to the news. Go, ahead, Eddie. go, go ahead, Eddie. No, I just I think that, I think we need to nuance the conversation. We I think we need to think about Ben Shapiro as as an example of a particular kind of conservative voice that's being invited to college campuses that in some ways take advantage of the norms of openness. Uh, that is what, to do say, mean, what do you mean take advantage? What of I mean by this is this: is that there are some people you when you invite into your space who hold positions that call into question the very norms that allow the space to exist. Like what positions so, has been? For example, what do I mean? But what I mean by that is this, and I'm talking about this generally about certain speakers because I want to be very clear that thousands of conservative uh, intellectuals speak on college campuses across the uni across the country every day. These sorts of events happen around particular sorts. So of what? 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 what, so what, what I mean by this? What's, what's been Shapiro no, said that should, part, should cause violence? Cause no, people no, I'm not trying to say. I was making now. a general claim, right? So right. part of the part of the claim I'm making, and I know we got to get to the news, is this. No, we don't. Okay, yeah, that's what. Because <laughs> part of what part that's of not what people tune into this for. Part of what I'm I'm trying to suggest here is that what happens when a, a, a conservative speaker or a particular particular kind of uh, speaker makes the claim that certain people don't belong in this intellectual space, that we've sacrificed the norms, or let me say, we've sacrificed our admissions criteria, uh, and they're a particular group of people that should not be, it should not have been admitted to our campus, right? And I've, I've seen this on Princeton's campus, when right. someone came in to make a very, very volatile argument, I thought, around affirmative action. Okay. And the students protested. Right. Now, it's certainly consistent with the norms of the university to allow for open dialogue and right. exchange. Right. But what happens when someone takes advantage of, of those norms to call into question the very ways in which that community is constituted? Well, is, well, that a, is that a proposition that merits property destruction and violence? Of course not. What Eddie, what's your, Eddie, what's your point? I'm not, I'm not. My, my point is this, is that every institution has to grapple with uh, the challenge of, of, of of its values, when its values are being taken advantage to call that institution into question. Let me be more concrete. So when the university allows for open and free inquiry and then people come in 
and then make arguments that challenge the very people who are in that community. But you can't be delicate about the arguments this that is, are being but made. But this is precisely the case. What so is, when I get so when I get when I'm faced with an argument that I somehow am a beneficiary of affirmative action, which I am, by the way. Right. And by virtue of that fact, I shouldn't be there. And then I challenge the person in right. a very direct way. Right. Right. And then that becomes the basis for, um, I'm losing my train of thought here, that becomes the basis, well, anyway. Do you think it's productive for people to interrupt a conservative speaker to walk up on the stage to block his ability to in give the message to the point yes. where that person has to be let out by security? No, not that doesn't mean, but in some instances I think there are moments where I don't feel uh, uh, it uh, necessary for me to have to endure an argument so, that questions my presence. Okay, but, but at here's, the the, here, here's what I believe is the flaw in that thinking. And it is what it, I think it's one of the things that have made liberals less able to defend their arguments in the rough and tumble of, uh, uh, of politics is that if, let's, let's take an issue like pro life. Okay. If I'm in law school and I say to my class, that uh, I'm pro-life, right? Um, that's a position that about 50% of Americans, if, if you believe Gallup, support. I will be booed, I will be harassed. People will say I don't want uh, to support women's right to choose, that I'm this, that I'm that, that I'm, 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 I need to go back to the cave, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm, I'm saying this because Ben Shapiro was talking about pro-life last night and, and, and this came to mind. If you get up and say that you're pro-choice, you were applauded and you were cheered and you don't face any of the abuse that I have faced. Now, who, if that is your educational experience for 18 years and then for four years in undergrad and then three years in law school, but I know, which I did know, that every time I opened my mouth, in certain quarters, I was going to get my head knocked off. Which one of us do you think is going to be more prepared to tell people why I am pro-life or why I believe that the Second Amendment means what the Second Amendment means, or why you can just, or why we need to reform and save Social Security and Medicare, and why? Because every time in my educational experience, I get my head knocked off. I would argue that if there is a student at Princeton that is offended by someone coming in saying the worst thing that's ever happened to America was affirmative action and Eddie Gloud should not have been a recipient of affirmative action and he shouldn't be where he is because of affirmative action I would argue there's the first person you want liberal kids to go in here because they're gonna hear it and if they're respectful and if they listen it will get their minds working they'll hear the best arguments. That's what I always want to hear. I, I always want to hear the other side's best arguments, so I'm this prepared. Is, but this is the point. In universities and colleges, students are confronted, are confronting, are exposed to a wide range of ideological positions every single day. Right. There are particular issues that are vexing like to the environment. Affirmative action. Well, who gets to decide no, who gets what, to decide what, I'm what, saying is, what I'm saying are. is that what those issues typically revolve around, and they have revolved around it since uh, major universities have been integrated. They, since black and brown people entered those schools and since women entered those schools, typically this debate occurs around issues that revolve uh, around issues that concern black folk that have revolved issues or, 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 or around issues that involve right. women around the cultural issues and that call into question the very so right? confront it no we do I, I do it every day in right. my classes right. but part of what I'm trying to say is that this doesn't happen right when the with the conservative interpreter of Aristotle or the conservative reader of Chaucer it's happening with the bright Smart folks. It's happening with the folks who want to use the cover of the value of the university to put forward noxious views. The notion, that, that, the notion that affirmative action is, is a, uh, the debate around that is something that's universal and exclusive to the fringe of the Republican Party is a misreading of the Republican Party. That's I would, actually a, what, what that's a that? real debate that's going on within the right and to disengage from it is to pretend that debate doesn't exist. No, what I'm saying though, the, the affirmative action in the context of, well I'm sorry, we're good. No, 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 I just want to go to Caddy K really quickly and then we'll get back to Eddie. It's 25 after we've done absolutely no news and I have got to say I'm more proud of this 
this segment than any segment we've ever done. Caddy K. Okay. okay, Eddie, I'm going to take objection to what you say. I mean, it would be one thing if the only time there were objections to people on campus were when they really were genuinely neo-Nazis or alt-right or anti-Semitic or anti-women. But that's just not the case. Look at 2014 when both Condoleezza Rice and Christine Lagarde had oh to withdraw God. themselves from giving speeches at uh, Rutgers and Smith universities because one worked in the uh, in the Bush administration and because one was the head of the International Monetary Fund. That's how far it's gone on American campuses. It's not just what we're seeing in Berkeley. It mm. starts when people like that feel they can't go and speak because there's somehow an objection to them because they come from a more conservative economic or political position. Well, obviously, I would take issue with not allowing uh, Condoleezza Rice and, but, and but others to... But that's what happened. To, but, it, but I think it's important that we understand that these are isolated moments, that they're, that they're not generalizable to, the co to colleges and universities uh, uh, across the country. Um, I think it's the case that, it, in, in particularly, uh, the, in, 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 in particularly po powerful and controversial moments, uh, like the Iraq war, uh, uh, issues around IMF in terms of its, its policies vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, the, the, the developing world. Uh, it can generate passions, and those passions can evidence... This was 2014. Evidence, I, I, I the Iraq Eddie, war wasn't the, even a story. I mean, I'm again, just saying Eddie, that Eddie. if that can happen then with these two individuals, it is no surprise that we're seeing what we're seeing on universities. And I think it, I it's a think real it's, suggestion Eddie, that there's an there's intolerance a, level on I, American I, campuses, I which Eddie, isn't helpful. Eddie, Eddie, there's That's a difference between... Not somebody right. who is purely spewing hatred. If a Nazi stands up or a woman, you know, that's against, you know, equal rights versus a conservative, unpopular view. By the way, we can have a five hour debate about affirmative action. Very intelligent people can mm -hmm. give you an argument against it. Okay. I'm certainly not one of those, but they can. But other than the absolute black and white, no pun intended, hate spewing. And Joe, I think, brings up a, I hate to say this, a really, really <laughs> smart point in that that's the way you, that's the way you toughen the other side. We're going to have young liberals who can't hear the other side. We're going to have very ineffective liberals this is, going this, forward. Donnie, this is the point I'm trying to make, and I'm not making it very articulately, and this is really unsettling for me. <laughs> can, we, can we get any <laughs> cocktail, I'm please? passionate, and it's early in the morning. Um, I think this is an ongoing caricature of oh, universities yeah, and oh, colleges. It's not, it's not. Yes, you I think be so. Be a conservative for I think, a week. No, 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 no. I think, I oh, think come so. come on. And I think it has... I think Stephen it, Miller's like he is. Be a, no, 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 no. Be a I, conservative I, I, for a week over the past 40 years in American about. universities. I, I actually... Oh, my God. I, Joe, Joe, if you look at what's happened to, to colleges and universities uh, since the, the 1980s, if you look at the ways in which uh, the universities have been overdetermined by administrations that have grown exponentially, when you look at uh, who runs departments, when you are inside faculty meetings, when you see how the what culture... What do you find there? Because I will oh, guarantee my... you, you do not find Republicans. Yeah. Come on. I, I got to gotta tell you, I, I got to hear you say something. I went to the University of Alabama, one of the most conservative states in America, I couldn't name one professor, and I loved all my professors, loved them. I really did. It was, it was an incredible four years. I learned so much, even though it may not show on TV every morning. I couldn't name one conservative professor over four years that taught me in political science, in history, in English. They just weren't there. I went on to law school. I would state, Caddy, established law. And people would shuffle their feet at the University of Florida in con law class. I, 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 would, answer a question, I would answer a question from a professor that 80% of Americans would agree with. And that 80% of courts would agree with. And people would shuffle their feet. It didn't happen a lot. The professor would? No. The, the okay. students in class. The professor would allow it. If I were a professor, I would, I would take their heads off. But again... I was fine. I turned around most of the time and I'd laugh at him. So are you kidding me? But I'm saying this not for conservatives. I'm saying this for liberals. They have been bubble wrapped in, in, in academia for 40 years. And then they wonder why they wake up and see that George W. Bush has won two elections and see that Donald Trump has been elected president of the United States. They get 
destroyed in 2016, and in 2017, they still don't have a message to take to America. There's a reason why, and Caddy, I blame American colleges. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, you know, I agree. If they, are, if I, if we think our students are too fragile that they can't even hear from the likes of Christine Lagarde and Condi Rice, then we have a real problem in American education, and we're not preparing them for for active debate in the real world. Hey, everybody, get. We got to go to break, but everybody, get. Can we get Eddie some coffee? Because he's really frustrated. <laughs> he's saying it's not fair that we've started this debate. At 6 a.m. It's unnatural, <laughs> isn't it? It, it? it is. It really is. No, so you should have taken Sam Kinison's course in Animal House, though. You would have had a conservative uh, teacher. Okay, very good. Still had a morning show. This <laughs> Come on, that morning. was good. That we was have, good. We actually have news we're going to have to get to. Mounting tensions, North Korea to fight sanctions and fires another ballistic missile, prompting emergency alerts in Japan. Plus, new details on the report that President Trump berated Attorney General Jeff Sessions in front of the other top officials. After the appointment of a special counsel on the Russia probe, we've got Michael Schmidt here of the New York Times. He broke that story. He's going to be with us next when Morning Joe returns. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube. And make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. And you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.